The problem of intersubjectivity in linguistic theory seemed to have been solved definitively by Ferdinand de Saussure. This so-called problem is the intellectual legacy of philosopher John Locke, who declared words to be imperfect, but at the same time indispensable instruments of human communication. The imperfection of words consisted in their meanings which Locke took to be ideas that the words stood for. According to Locke, the real problem were not the words as forms, which are shared by the community of speakers, but their meanings or ideas, which vary from one individual to another. In fact, Locke insisted that individuals attach their own private ideas to words, and that there is no guarantee whatsoever that two individuals attach the same idea to any word of complex abstraction, especially in philosophical discourse. Locke even went as far as to say that every speaker has his or her own language, and therefore there was no other solution to mutual understanding in linguistic communication than for the speaker or writer to provide lexical definitions for every word that could potentially mean something else for the hearer or reader. The problem is as old as philosophy itself. A question like, what is justice? either needs to be answered in respect to what justice really is, i.e. the thing justice, or in terms of the ideas behind the word justice. In one case we speak of real definition, in the other of lexical definition. Saussure provided an ingenious answer to Locke's linguistic skepticism. In fact, he proffered a new definition of what a language is. Not a nomenclature, i.e. a list of words that make reference to things outside of language, both concrete and abstract, but a self-contained system of linguistic signs whose meanings do not directly depend on anything external. Saussure thus was a Lockean in the sense that he believed meaning to be entirely psychological. Unlike Locke, however, Saussure held that we do not get to choose what meanings we attach to any word of the language. Languages already come with a fully formed system of signs, whose sound patterns and concepts or meanings are already predefined by the speakers of the language. Languages are social contracts over which individuals hold no sway. By endorsing such a deterministic view of language, Mutual understanding is no longer a theoretical puzzle. Speaker A encodes his or her idea by uttering certain sounds, and hearer B understands those sounds, decodes them, and thus has access to A's original idea. Mutual understanding, therefore, becomes a matter of sharing the same code, before understanding occurs. If A and B have different systems inbuilt into their minds, there is no longer any such guarantee, and interpersonal communication is subject to the very concerns formulated by Locke. There are, however, approaches to intersubjectivity grounded in semiotic realism rather than semiological idealism. The Thomistic philosopher and Peirce scholar John Dealey, for example, regards intersubjectivity as depending on questions of relation, which can be either of a dyadic or a triadic nature. Dealey endorses Saussure's vision of what a language is, namely a system of signs shared by the members of a speech community. He also espouses Saussure's view of human communication being a matter of making your, otherwise invisible, thoughts or ideas available to others. For instance, Dealey conjectures that if you want your audience to think of camels, you will make the noise camel. At the same time, however, Dealey sees Saussure's arbitrariness also in relation to the malleability of language. He says that if we exert the freedom proper to the human use of human signs, we can soon enough have our audience thinking of camels when we say horses. I dare say that has already happened with this audience, Dealey adds. 
Saussure would hardly have endorsed such a position on the arbitrariness of the sign. Signs need to be arbitrary because that makes them fixed signs of language A rather than language B. Swapping the sign horse for the sign camel has nothing to do with languages as abstractions in the Saussurean sense, but are merely idiosyncratic games we can play at the level of linguistic interaction. Dilly rejects Saussurean idealism understood as the proposition that the mind knows nothing except what the mind itself makes, i.e. the severing of language from what Dilly calls objective reality, after the biologist Jakob von Uxkill. Dilly thinks that Saussure is wrong to postulate merely dyadic relations between individual signs. As a Peirce scholar, Dilly believes that signs always enter a triadic relationship. Thus, in a Persian framework, the symbolic sign camel, what Peirce calls the representamen, stands for or represents the animal so named, what Peirce calls the object signified, via the thought of a camel in someone's mind, what Peirce calls the interpretant. A sign cannot exist without an object, whether real or unreal. A sign cannot represent itself, it needs an object, and this is what Dealey means when he talks about purely objective reality in his 2009 book of the same title. We live in a world made of species-specific objects. Dealey's critique of Saussure concerns his failure to grasp that semiology, the study of abstract and culturally determined systems, like languages, needs to become part of a global semiotics, also called biosemiotics, which studies the relation of human and non-human signs to objects and treats culture as part of biology, in fact, semiotic biology. According to Dealey, in postmodernity, realism asserts itself in the form of semiotics, rather than in the form of orthodox science. The science and semiotics do not study the same phenomena. The former is interested in things, i.e. whatever constitutes the mind-independent physical environment. Things themselves are objectless, i.e. they are studied regardless of the kind of objects that they are for a certain species. In other words, they are studied without taking into account what Jakob von Uxkühl called Umwelt the environment as perceived and acted upon by the members of a certain species. Only humans are able to contemplate things objectively, in the sense that only humans can focus on objects detached from a particular Umwelt. And where there is no object, there can be no sign. Science thus understood is antithetical to semiotics. For Dili, Intersubjectivity requires no triadic relations because there is no sign mediation. Rather, the relation is of a dyadic nature. Intersubjectivity refers to the connection between one subjectivity and another. Relationships can be real, i.e. be part of what Dealey calls hardcore reality, or they can be unreal, i.e. be part of a social construction. Among the examples Dealey provides is the following. There are two adult men and there is one girl. One man thinks the girl is his biological daughter, but she isn't. Another man doesn't even know of the existence of this girl, but she is his biological daughter. In other words, the difference between the two is that the second relationship exists independently of anybody's opinion. It stems from the material realities of the world, two things that exist subjectively not objectively, whereas the first relationship comes purely from the mind. Another example discussed by Dili is the border between Bulgaria and Romania. The two countries are not subjectivities, they are objects of the human umwelt. As such, their relations must be triadic, for objects presuppose signs. Two countries cannot have dyadic relationships unlike a father to his son or daughter, where there is a real, hardcore connection between the two subjects. According to Dealey, relations depend for their existence on substances, 
but they exist over and above substances. Relations cannot be reduced to subjectivities. They are between them. This is intersubjectivity in Aristotle's original sense. Thus, for Dealey, intersubjectivity is not, Paque Saussure, about two minds sharing the same linguistic code. The biological relationship between, say, mother and daughter is of a different kind than the assertion that the two are speakers of the same language. Human beings believe in all sorts of things as part of hardcore reality, i.e. a thing being something that exists in relation to itself. Its existence is not dependent on something other than itself. But human beings can be wrong. Dealey mentions the example of witches. If it turns out that witches really exist, then they are things. They simply exist, as well as objects. They exist objectively in relation to something other than itself, namely in relation to science. If, on the other hand, it turns out that witches don't exist, they are only objects. They exist in the objective sense of reality, meaning semiotically objective. Signs and objects are not the same, even though only humans are able to grasp that distinction. Non-humans perceive objects, they are not aware that objects presuppose signs. Only humans are able to contemplate a thing, an object in relation to itself. Semiotics doesn't study biology in the scientific sense. Even if scientists believe they are describing things, they have to do this linguistically. Thus science cannot be without science, which makes the things objects. They become part of the human umwelt. Still, orthodox science does not purport to study the objective world. Instead, it clings to the concept of objectivity, which is thing-related, not object-related. Dealey affirms that it is very hard to find pure objects, i.e. that which does not belong to any umwelt, and thus is not mediated by science. Dealey describes the following scenario. The closest you can come to a pure object is when you run into something that you have had any experience of before, and you first see it, or hear it, or whatever, and comes to your mind the question, what is this? I'm sure you have had the experience of being in some strange house late at night and occurs some strange sound. You are startled and worried that it might be some intruder. You check out the house to see if there is anyone there, and finding nothing you say, ah, it was nothing, it was just a sound. Then, as you are returning to the living room with a sigh of relief, the intruder steps out from behind the door and kills you. You misread the sign. You thought it was only an object. Too bad. In this particular case, a pure object would be a sound, as opposed to a sound of something, an object of an Umwelt. So at first the person hearing the sound interpreted it as perhaps being a sound made by an intruder. Not finding anyone, the person concluded it was merely a sound, a thing. However, it turns out that the sound was actually a sign. It pointed to something beyond itself. The person realized it shortly before being killed. What are we to think of the notion of a pure object? As the linguist Roy Harris would argue, human perception is semiologically relevant when it contributes to a particular program of activity and leads to certain actions being taken as a result of that. In the case of the person finding himself in a strange house, hearing the sound led him to start a search in order to make sure he was not a burglar. No sooner than he realizes that there is nobody else in the house, the sound perceived minutes before and now existing in the person's memory as part of his past personal experience, ceases to have a semiological value i.e. it ceases to be a sign. When the burglar suddenly appears from behind the door on his way to the living room, the sound perceived is no longer of concern at that very moment. The intruder kills the other person who was taken by surprise. 
Obviously the question whether the sound was a pure object or a sign no longer matters to the dead. However, arguably, as soon as we perceive a sound, it is already embedded in the human umwelt.